Hello, I'm Tony Guida. This is My New York. The Tony Awards for Excellence in Broadway Theater will be presented this Sunday night at Radio City. A good opportunity, I thought, to shine a spotlight on Broadway as both an art form and a business. The eminent producer Manny Eisenberg is here, bursting with opinions, backed by mm, pretty fair credentials. In his brilliant career, Manny has won 11 Tonys, 10 Drama Desk Awards, and he's a member of the American Theater Hall of Fame. Curtain going up on Eisenberg, next. What fun it is to welcome Manny Eisenberg to this program. Good to see you. My pleasure. I am curious about how a kid from the Bronx at your time of, you know, growing up there gets interested in theater and thinks, I can make a living at this. I never thought about making a living. I, I, um, my uncle was an actor in yeah. the Yiddish theater, so my family went to the theater from the Bronx a neighborhood you know. Yes. And so it didn't become, it wasn't a mystery. It was a trip. You had to get in the subway for a long ride. Must have been a treat. No? Well, it, I didn't understand all the Yiddish. Ah. But the idea of, uh, of not working <laughs> was attractive. Because working, I was in the service, and, and I knew what the Army was like, and I knew what work was. And I thought, if I could have a job that didn't include work, and I got lucky. I'm, of course, being and, facetious. But of course, but, uh, and I think you found that over the next, well, once you got into it, over the next 50 some odd years, there was plenty of work involved. It's a different kind of work. Well, we'll talk about that. I, I, because I, there's a quote from you that, I, that, uh, that caught my attention, and, and it, it goes to that point, but we'll come to that in a minute. Uh, you, I just want to tell the audience that it was 1966 that you were involved in your first production, The Lion in Winter. Yes. So we're talking 51 years that you've been doing this, and kind of well, sort of well. Well, you, get, you have to be a little lucky. The Lion in Winter was not a success. In fact, the New York Times found it odious and loathsome. Mm. And when the movie came out, which won the Academy Award, right. or it won it for Katharine Hepburn, they found it equally odious and loathsome. <laughs> this was the critic from the Times, but... Um, Should I be surprised that you remember that quote? Yes, oh, it's in, it's, it's, I have it tattooed on my arm. <laughs> I would think so. Um, yes. Well, you talk about luck. Maybe, and, I'm, and again, you're underestimating your talent, but there's a certain amount of luck in meeting Neil Simon. Well, you know why that, that story was. The, the one thing I, I thought I really could do was play baseball. You know, not in the big leagues, but, but in our schoolyard world. And Redford was a friend, Robert Redford, and he did a play called Barefoot in the Park. Right. Uh, Neil and he Simon. called up one day, Neil Simon wrote Barefoot in the Park, and they said, I had played ball with Redford, and he said, Mildred Natwick cannot play shortstop on this team. You have to play. And I loved playing. So Redford played first base, I played shortstop, and Neil Simon played second base. Hmm. And so Eisenberg I'm winding to up... Simon to Whoever uh, was the, the, <laughs> Eisenberg the Simon to Redford. Really? That was yeah, he was first best, sure. And Redford was a good ball player. And and so we be, all became friends and uh, that has lasted. So it was 1963 I think you you meet Simon playing playing in the Broadway Show League, but uh what what do you, what clicked between you and him? It's something it, actually you understand. We come from the same neighborhood in the yeah. Bronx. That's true. Yeah, he's from the... So, and Neil's stuff is all personal. It's about him and growing up in, in the world that you and I grew up in. So I understood that. I also understood who he was, which is 
he is a, an intuitive writer. Neil could write 30 pages and give it to me and say, what do you think? And if he left it in the drawer for six months, he'd pick it up and say, this is interesting. Who wrote this? <laughs> so you have to know who, they, who you're dealing with, and you don't intrude in that process. After a while, you could come up with, with criticisms, but not telling him how to write. You just, when he did, for example, um, Broadway Bound, great scene that Linda Lavin won the Tony in, was written four weeks before we went into rehearsal. Mm. And the only conversation we had is he asked me about the play, and I said, I missed the mother in the second act. And he nodded his head and then wrote a scene that came from nowhere, which was the key scene in the play. That, that I, you, you learn, don't intrude in the artist's procedure. Well, but be visceral responses that you engaged me here. The best example was when I, I did a play with Tom Stoppard, and we were afraid to have an opinion because he's so smart and we're so dumb. And I hid in the theater. I was hiding, hiding in the back. And there's a tap on the shoulder. And Stoppard said, what do you think? And I just blurted out 10 minutes into the second act. I was looking at the scenery. I wasn't paying attention. And he nodded his head and came back three or four days later and said, is it better? Mm. And then you get an idea of what your job is. Your well, I want to talk is... more about the job and the way you defined it in a second in a quote I was referring to before. But I think our audience needs to know, if they don't already, that the, that the relationship between you and Simon is one of the most extraordinary in the theater business and one of the most successful. Manny produced all, that's all of Neil Simon's plays. He produced The Sunshine Boys. From The Sunshine Boys. From The Sunshine Boys on. The Sunshine Boys, Chapter Two, They're Playing Our Song, Brighton Beach Memoirs, Biloxi Blues, Broadway Bound, Lost in Yonkers, The Goodbye Girl, Laughter on the 13th Floor, and I think that's the list, but there may be a couple more. Uh, there are about seven more. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, uh, it must come to 17 or 20. Just Simon. We got along. It was, it was, and there were fights. Oh, sure. Well, let's, let me, I've been referring to this quote. Let's get to it. A, this is what you say about your job. A producer tries to create an atmosphere that is genuinely comfortable so the best creative work can take place. You try to keep peace because there are so many disparate groups within the theater. Atmosphere, convivial, not convivial, but uh, nurturing um, creativity, but <laughs> being a cop too, apparently. Yeah, we fired a lot of people too. But I think that we, that's true. You get the best work out of everybody when they don't spend 50% of their time being defensive. So if you're dumb enough to come up with suggestions that are questionable, the author or even the actor will spend so much time defending it as opposed to coming up with something else. And since I, I really did a lot of shows. You 70, see, I think, yeah. 70, 71. Something like it. My daughter and I disagree about one or two, but you, you, you know good things can happen. Mm. And it's your job to allow them to happen, and very often they don't happen. You think about it six months after the show closed, of what you might have done. But we've benefited from it a few times, and Broadway Bound would be a classic. In what sense? In that Neil sat down and wrote a scene that you could not have imagined because he was free to do it and he wasn't spending any time arguing with Gene Sachs, the director, or me. Because mm. our, our, when he asked what we thought at a particular reading, I said, I miss the mother. Oh, yeah. Well, and I'm Gene sorry. said he didn't like this character, but nobody told him what to write. So he didn't spend any time defending it. Mm. I did one, one had one moment with Neil about, you always knew that products or cheap jokes would come out. We did a play once called God's Favorite, and it wasn't very good. 
and there was a line about hemorrhoids. Not the more funniest subject. No. So two weeks went by, and it's still in the play, and I said, Neil, hemorrhoids? And he said, don't you think I know? I don't have anything better. <laughs> so you have to know that if you right. take a scene out, you have to put one in. Right. So until he comes up with a good substitute, ultimately, it, of course, it came out. He found another idea. Well, it, it's tempting to ask you, and you've been alluding to them, can you think of some legendary fights that you had to mediate when keep the peace? Is there no, I had one to fight with him. Yeah. I chased him around the city once, and we were going to get into it physically. Really? Over what? I posted the notice on a play, on a musical, Little Me, which we did small, and it was no good. The show was no good. And it was time to get it out, and he didn't want it. He didn't argue when I posted the notice, but I, when I left the theater, he took it down. Posted the closing notice. Posted yeah. the closing yeah. notice. And <laughs> that was an expensive takedown, because then you have another week's expenses. And I called him on the phone, I said, I'm coming after you. And there was like a car chase around the city. He went to this place, that place, whatever. And then we broke up the relationship for three weeks. Mm. It was over. Mike Nichols called and lawyers called. It was all sorts of... Wow. And then Neil's agent called and said, he wants to repair it. So, and we never, never talked about it to this day. That's the way to repair it, I guess. Uh, yeah, move on. There's a scar right there. <laughs> yeah. um, let's talk about the Tonys a little bit. Um, maybe just the, the major categories. In, of course, Manny votes uh, for the awards. The Best Play nominations, A Doll's House Part 2, Indecent, Oslo, and Sweat. I saw Sweat, and I, uh, it's quite a play. A little preachy, but... Of those four, that's the only one I have seen. I think that it's a, it's a genuine competition, but Sweat won the uh, Pulitzer Prize, and that's going to give it an edge. It's also... should mention the brilliant writer, Lynn Nottage. Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, if you ask me, I think Sweat has the edge. And Odal's House is, a, is an interesting play, too. Oslo... I think any one of them could win, but I think Sweat has the edge. Lynn Nottage deserves it also. And when you look at this list, uh, I think you were telling me it, it, what jumps out at you is what's not on the list, what wasn't nominated. You mean of the, of, well, what it wasn't nominated of the musicals is, a, well, is big. Oh. War Paint and it wasn't nominated and Charlie was, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and Amelie and Okay, and I we'll think come to that. I've, I've forgotten you were talking about musicals. Let's talk about the ones that are nominated. Come From Away, Dear Evan Hansen, Groundhog Day, the musical, and Natasha Pierre and the Great Comet of 1812. And you're saying, in your estimation, a couple of others should have been on that list. It's always that the nominators... There's a certain arbitrariness to... to sure. You know, these, the Tonys do not come down from Mount Sinai. The hospital or the place in... <laughs> Sometimes they wow. should go to the hospital, but, uh, or they end up in the hospital. Wow. No, this is going to come down to Evan Hansen and Come From Away. Okay. Come uh, From Away is popular and has such a good soul. It's a good-hearted evening. Yeah, yeah. And Evan Hansen is a, is a well-worked piece. He's a, it was courageous to do that. Best performance by an actor in a play, Dennis Arndt, Chris Cooper, Corey Hawkins, Kevin Klein, Jefferson Mays. If you ask me to bet, Kevin Klein. Okay. What's his nickname? Tell the audience his nickname. Look, uh, Kevin was a star very early, in, very early in, in my career. Kevin's been around a long time. 20th century. He did a musical when he was like 23 or something like that. And... He's done an occasional work on the stage. He's a really maybe one of the best American actors there ever was. But he said no to so many plays 
that he was called Kevin Decline. <laughs> and and I hope he doesn't get angry with that. No. I, I'm an admirer. It's clear. And we'll take one more category, the best performance by an actress in a leading role in a play. And this list, uh, I mean, talk about all-stars. The five women nominated, Kate Blanchett, Jennifer Ely, Sally Field, Laura Lindsay, and Laurie Metcalf. I mean, that's... You don't get all, bigger star power than that. That's and a, acting chops, I would... That's an all-star, which... We have to have the... You have these awards, and the Oscars as well. It, it's a great hype for an industry. But it's not real competition. The idea that Laura Linney and Laurie Metcalf are competing, it's not the 100 yard dash. They're both, all of those women, they're, they're all stars. Yeah. They, if we had awards for excellence, all five get it. So I know that they won't, someone will win. And if you ask me which, I'd say either Laurie Metcalf or Laura Linney. Mm -hmm. But to say the others lost. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's so, uh, there's something about, I mean, I understand that the Oscars and the, the Tonys and other big award shows are about PR and, and hype and, you know, getting people interested in that, you know, in the movies and theater, OBs, off-Broadway. Uh, but it, there's something odious about putting people, you know, Laura Linney, Laurie Metcalf, I mean, or whoever. And uh, Yes, and, and, and at the end of it, someone will say, well, I lost to... Yeah. You lost? Yeah. You got nominated was great, and then you lose. It's... Uh, yeah. th those five... There's something act actually wonderful about five first-rate actresses on the stage. That's, we haven't had that in a long time. That's a good time. point. You, you, uh, to see that quality of, of, of um, art and artistic uh, ability on the stage, there's, uh, well, it, it, it leads to a couple of questions which uh, are about plays and why uh, it's so difficult for plays to make it as opposed to musicals. But before you answer that, I want to ask you about one show that is on Broadway now. It's a revival. It's a revival of Sunday in the Park with George, which you produced, the original. One of my favorite uh, Sondheim pieces. Uh, have you seen it? No. <laughs> but. There's something very nice about shows that you did that are revived. It's kind of a, a, a left-handed recognition. But if I go, and I did go in the past, and you see it and it's better than what, you, what I did right. or what I participated in, mm. that's not a good feeling. It's a sleep. And if it's worse, you're outraged. I couldn't. I don't come out ahead, on, no matter what my experience is. And this one, I'm told, is really good, as was the previous one with the projections. Yeah, I saw that. And it taps right into my ego, and 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 it happened with a few plays. Yeah. But I I can't overcome it. <laughs> well, there's no need. need. <laughs> There's no need for you to do that. As, as long as we're on the subject of, of other uh, plays that Manny produced, I went through the Neil Simon list uh, a moment ago. These are other Manny Eisenberg productions on Broadway. Mark Twain Tonight, Two Gentlemen of Verona, The Wiz, Ain't Misbehavin', That Championship Season, Rent, Master Harold and the Boys, Sunday in the Park, and Boz Lerman's La Boheme, and that's just a partial list. A couple of them, I was just the, the general manager. Oh, okay. Yeah. And Rent was done by Jeffrey and Kevin, who, uh, Jeffrey Seller and Kevin McCollum, who did, uh, Jeffrey did Hamilton. Mm -hmm. 
So, but Hamilton, they, have we heard of that? Heard about that one? I've heard about. It. I think it's doing pretty well. Yeah, those are the two contemporary producers who I have great affection for. More than 50 years doing this, Manny, and you've seen many changes over those years, and I was perhaps alluding to one a moment ago. Am I, I'm a civilian, I'm not in that, in your business, it, but it seems to me it gets harder and harder for a play, a straight play, to succeed on Broadway uh, than musicals. Is, is that a fair? Yes. And I think it's, it's, it's sad and absolutely true. Uh, one, plays used to cost $150,000 to put on. They now cost $4 million. That's one. Two, we have not nurtured an audience. We've nurtured an audience for musicals, but not for plays. So even the plays that I did in the 80s and even in the 90s, if they were successful, they ran a year and a half. You don't have plays on Broadway that are running more than three or four months for the most part. And that's because a star is in it and he'll only be in it or she'll only be in it for three or four months. There are no road companies of plays. Look at all the jobs that existed. When we did the tri Neil Simon trilogy in the 80s, Brighton Beach, Biloxi Blues, Broadway Bound, you know the people who were in it? Woody Harrelson, Nathan Lane, Jason mm. Alexander, Robert Sean Leonard, Johnny Cryer, Patrick Dempsey, to name only a few. There were jobs for young actors in New York and on the road. That doesn't happen anymore. So that there are fewer jobs. And that means that the good actors go right out to California and they're in a series or they're in a, a cable show. So there's a diminishment and it's a loss. And the audience, we have not nurtured young people to go. Hamilton nurtures young people. If you well, I want, to, I, I want to follow that up. What has Broadway or uh, the culture not nurtured? How has that happened? How has how is, how is you get this result that you're talking about, not, not nurturing the, uh, an audience for plays, as you said? One, there's competition. It's the, compu it's the screen, all of the screens, the computers, the Game Boys, so Young people are, are, are using their thumbs. They don't, they don't have to walk to the theater. They just... Yeah. And you get every bit of information on, that, on, the, on the screen in front of you. Kids grow up that way. And the theater has, has been neglected. We didn't take care of it. And in what sense? We're, we live in a, in, a, in a real capitalist society. You have to make a living. And if the competition of film and television and cable pays you hundreds of thousands of dollars and millions of dollars, and the theater pays you $400 a week, you don't do that. You don't do the theater. So there's that economic issue. Uh, the musicals have evolved to being the attraction, but that's a theme park attraction. Not a revel you don't go to the theater for revelation anymore, or at least m most people. When you say theme park attraction for musicals, what do you mean? And there's some good theme park. A Lion King is a great theme park attraction. It's not about... Tom Stoppard is quoted as saying he went into the theater because it was the matrix of his moral sensibility. Nobody quite understood that. that right. But after you thought about it for a while, you went to the theater years ago instead of going to church or to the synagogue. You got your morality and your sensibility and your moral sensibility from Death of a Salesman or Shakespeare or Man for All Seasons or something like that. And you walked out as if, when I saw Death of a Salesman twice, to the Mike Nichols one rec recently, it was like a great sermon. You went out respectfully and quietly. And you thought... You also weren't sipping well, I, drinks I, I, and eating M&Ms, which is what you do in the theater now. I had that, I had that experience at, uh, and it's, it's going to escape me now, um, 
the the real mammoths play the you know real estate guys. Uh, uh, Glenn Gary. Glenn, Glenn Gary. Glenn. I sat in the theater when the when the w I hate this job. The final line, and I was stunned. I mean, I just. That's a great play, and if it, and it was it's been done well twice. One was the one with Alan Alda, and one was the original. There was one that it wasn't very good, but. That, I put that uh, Glenn Gary up as one of the great American plays. Well, I remember, I also remember, I mean, it's interesting, I remember the last line of the play. I also remember that the audience for maybe a second or two, when he says that last line and the curtain is coming down, there was just silence and then a roar of applause. Um, so overall, Take the temperature of Broadway. What, is it healthy? Is it? I mean, well, there are two definitions of that. One is, you know, money, and one is art. Is it healthy as an art form? No. I mean, it that diminishment of the play and the playwrights. If you if, years ago you could say who are the American playwrights, and you'd say Williams, Miller, Inge, O'Neill, Simon, Albee. Hmm. Who can you name now? You don't have a list. And in England, you can do the same thing, that there would have been five or six playwrights, Robert Bolt and, Simon and, and uh, Alan Bennett and Tom Stoppard, and we can't name those playwrights anymore. The young writers are going out to California and writing for cable, and the best writing, I think, is in some of those cable things that yeah. they do. Well, I, 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 but in terms I, of musicals, no, it's, it's booming. I did look up somewhere, and I don't know what I did with that note, but it's about just about ticket prices. In 1980, it was like the New York Times, I think it was 1984, the New York Times said, lamented that the cost of a ticket to a Broadway show or musical was going to hit the uh, horrendous $50. And I did the math in terms of inflation. So fifty dollars then today would be a hundred and nine dollars. I'd like to know what show you can go to, what musical, for instance, you can go to for a hundred and nine dollars. They're not even going to let you in the door for a hundred and nine dollars. No, that's an issue. That's a real issue. But you, there are discounts. Right. Like the ticket booth, you get it, tickets at half price. But now, it ultimately, it ultimately will change the aesthetics because this has to be theme park kind of attraction. Right. And at some point it all has to fall apart. Well, let's hope it's not soon. It's a delight to have you here, to, and to have this intelligent and insightful discussion of, a, of an art form that is so uh, important to this city and to, to many people, including you. It's a delight to see you, and thank you. It's my pleasure. Good to see you, Tony. And thank you for watching. We'll see you next week.